Well, that makes sense to your ex. Trying to repair the damage. But, but, you know, mankind's not actually doing this to repair the damage. Mankind's doing this because we want to drive our vehicles around. So, like, are there better ways that we could put that we could put CO2 into the atmosphere other than burning fossil fuels? Wait, All right, real quick. Can you guys hear that? No. Maybe. So question carbon is like the wrong thing to do because I hope they don't figure out how to do well, that. The problem isn't, isn't, isn't carbon dioxide at all. The problem, it's a lack of the cycling? The problem is that we're, we, we've cut down so many trees, as we mentioned previously. The oceans um, don't make enough oxygen for everybody. Yeah, Just all, the fish. All, all the massive deforestation that occurred first in the Bronze Age and then followed up with dirt with after the Industrial Age. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's for sure. We haven't replenished those forests. They've been cut down, yes, but they've been replaced with monocultures of junk trees. Of, of, well, of trees that uh, that the logging industry thought they could maybe come back and harvest again for for a profit. In the case of you know pines, massive monocultures of pines, and in some places like, like yeah, where I where I was at in the Ozarks, most of those were eastern red cedar, which is really a junk tree because they, they they they're plugging Oklahoma. Uh, they plug Western farm or like. Cattle, cattle can't. They don't provide shade for cattle. Nothing can grow under them. You kind of either got to trim them up or cut them down because they're just. Eh. Right, they're not a totally Bugs useless. Don't eat them. They're not a totally useless tree in the environment, but an eastern red cedar is also not particularly good for for uh, for the logging industry either. Or your cattle. Or, or anything they else. They spread right? like weeds, and they. They occupy. All the layers. They occupy all, all the right, layers right, of right. the forest that you yeah, saw have all the way down to the, to the ground cover there, which is my main gripe about this. Year. Uh, it takes up every bit of space. Every rancher agrees. It takes up every bit of space that you could be it, growing It's not in edible. It's not good fodder. Whatever. Hello, everybody. You your cow's not going to take a nap <laughs> under me, that uh, thing. Switch over here yeah. to just uh, regular view and stop, uh, you that, can make, uh, uh, stop that screen you can share. Make, you can... All right. So how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, so a couple days ago, Mary had me. Had me. Uh stuck in the in the pickup truck and was grilling me about some things um we started talking about the the, the way uh gases go into solution come out of solution and uh that's i've been thinking on that for a while this past week particularly um uh, probably next week i'll have a, a presentation on on that to, to to discuss but for now let me stop that okay there we go all right, so for now, we're going to talk about uh, what we're we talking about tonight. Oh, yes, the balance of nature. It's like a curious and unusual thing, the balance of nature. There was a uh, oh, one of those, I don't know what you call them, memes, I guess, popped up on, uh, on Facebook uh, about two or three weeks ago, give or take. And... Uh, I think it was Anson Ivy responded to, to this 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 thread, and the question was, uh, or the, the thing was, explain poorly what you do for a living. And of course, Anson Ivy, he's uh, uh, Ivy's forging homestead. He he does blacksmithing, and his response was, "I am the keeper of the magical blue smoke. Sometimes it escapes, and I have to find out where it escaped from to fix it." <laughs> Which is a pro, poor explanation of operating a forge, if I ever heard one. But I decided I was going to get in on the fun. I don't know why I picked up the guitar. I'm not going to play anything. I decided I was going to get in on the fun and, and, and try to explain poorly what it is that I do for a living. And I think I probably messed that up. And, and I explained it a little bit more accurately than, uh, than I had intended to. My response was, I attempt to persuade an intelligent species to not go extinct. <laughs> That's the way I say it. That's what I do for a living is try, try to keep an intelligent species from going extinct. The pay is not great. Oh yeah, we replaced the coffee cup. It is no longer green, so it no longer, no longer um, shows the, the 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 green screen background. So attempting to keep an intelligent species from going going extinct. Hello, how to garden? Oh, we also have uh, Brian and John and Mary is around here somewhere. So attempting to keep an intelligent species from going extinct part going extinct part of that is. Uh, trying to combat some of the 
some of the weird, crazy ideas that are that are popular out there that are not entirely factual, but if we follow them and do do things in earnest about them, we will lead ourselves to certain destruction. Um, let me show you something real quick. If you happen to have a, a broomstick at home and a, a toilet paper tissue tube, uh, preferably with tissue on it, you can do this little experiment. Boy. Let's... Uh, Let's get this and bring it over here. Now, the setup is simple. I've got um, right here a, oh, wow. This is a, um, a broomstick, right, broom handle. And I can hold it with just two fingers here. Well, two fingers and my thumb. And I can keep it fairly, fairly level with two fingers and a thumb. All right. Now, this this roll of toilet, toilet tissue which we've had stocked up for about two or three years already, and we did not have to go and run out and buy toilet tissue <laughs> when everybody was panicking. This toilet tissue is not heavy. It's, it's very light. It's a very little bit, of, very little bit of, of, of weight to it. So I'm going to put it here on the, uh, on the stick. So close to my fingers, close to that balance point. Wow, it reflects that green and, and uh, starts to, to go into the background. When it's close to the balance point, it's easy to hold. Well, okay, it's not easy, easy to hold, but it's a lot easier to hold. Hey, there's Sass Press Red. All right. But look, the close or the more I move this away from the balance point, the more effort I have to. Ooh, yeah, I'm I'm really having to pinch down hard to hold it. Harder, harder. If you do this at home, just hold it with two fingers if you can. I'm really straining. I'm straining in. I can't hold it any longer. Okay, so even though this is a very, very lightweight setup here, very, very lightweight, the further I move away from a point of balance, the harder it is to hold the thing level and constant. The more effort I have to expend, the more energy I have to expend. Uh, if we we're going to make this an analogy for, for farming, the further away we move from the setup that nature ordinarily has, the more energy, the more inputs, the more effort that you have to expend to maintain an unbalanced system. Um, this is really the reason why modern agriculture, as wonderful as it is, can't feed the world. <clears throat> so that's Press Red saying, cedar isn't as good anymore as you think. Um, yeah. You, you, uh, there, there are a couple of varieties of cedar that are good for medicinal purposes. The the eastern red cedar isn't really one of them. It is a little bit, but not as good as uh, as the western red cedar. If you're looking for uh, something to help uh, fight off insects and things of that nature. Anyway, that conversation that we opened up with, we were talking about uh, about really essentially imbalances in nature, and uh, to a certain extent, the law of unintended consequences. Uh, so back during the Bronze Age, I don't know if I cut off, cut off the, the conversation before that, but you can always go back and watch uh, Mary's Tulsa Fox, the, the, the videos that she just dropped. Uh, they're not exactly in order, so you'll have to meddle through there. Uh, started talking about the uh, occurrences during the Bronze Age around the Mediterranean, whenever the, uh, the nations of, of, of the Mediterranean were uh, exploring uh, metallurgy, making bronze for arrowheads, armor, weapons, etc., uh, cutting down trees for masts for ships and planking for ships and stuff of that nature. There was a lot of deforestation that took place around the Mediterranean and also a little bit around Europe. Uh, during the Industrial Age, after the Europeans arrived in, in, in North America, they started cutting again. And right now, if you were to go out and look around, you can see large, vast regions in the United States that are covered with wilderness, lots and lots of trees. Uh, but it's not old growth forests. It's, it's the stuff that grew back after the uh, the clear cutting happened, and there was a lot of clear cutting all across from east coast to west coast. As a result of that clear cutting, and the not incredibly intelligent replanting operations that took place afterwards, um, we don't quite have the amount of photosynthesis occurring in North America that happened or that we had prior to that meaning we're not converting CO2 into oxygen at the rate that we would have previously. 
And uh, that's one of the reasons why whenever they take measurements, the CO2 parts per million keeps on going up and up and up and up. Clear, uh, says, clear cut the Ozarks and you get what you have now. Lots of eastern red cedar. Um, the Phoenician took Native America's copper. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It wound up over there for somehow. <laughs> Whether it was the Phoenicians that did it or someone else, I don't know. But somehow it did wind up over there in, uh, in Af uh, North Africa and in Europe and in parts of Asia. So it was here. It wound up over there, and it did it during a time that we don't have any recorded history. So, yay. Vicky's saying, sleet outside, but snug as a bug in the rug, and you're stocked up for weeks. That's awesome. Yep, yep, yep. No, okay, you're saying Arkansas PBS had an awesome document on the subject, fire and ice. Talking about the the clear cutting of the Ozarks or the or the possible Phoenicians Phoenicians getting their hands on the uh, the Great Lakes copper. <laughs> All right. Uh, in some places, other than just the Ozarks, the they took some efforts to try to plant trees that they thought they would be able to use later on. So lots of white pine, some yellow pine, other things that they figured that they could come back and cut. Now, down there in Arkansas right now and some other places in the south, they're actively farming trees, um, which is a little bit different from what they did in the Ozarks, which is they just planted stuff to stop erosion. On the bright side, they planted stuff to stop erosion, which is good. On the downside, they didn't really know what they were doing. Um, the, the 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 modern study of forestry is 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 well it's modern <laughs> this is the 1900s they didn't know what they didn't know so I, I guess we can't gripe at them too much other than say geez did you really have to cut everything down couldn't you have just gone straight to, to tree farming right off the bat um pine is like corn in central illinois it's ubiquitous it's everywhere but it wasn't everywhere to begin with. This is this, this is one of those things that was introduced afterwards. Um, during the, I guess it was the early 1900s, they started noticing that there was a, a fungal infection that was that was infesting the pine trees. And since there, the, the logging industry was very heavily invested into growing pines for producing lumber, timber, uh, they were very concerned with this fungal infest infestation. So they tried to figure out where it was coming from, and they discovered that it was uh, it was uh, hosting in another species of, of plant that was in the in the woods. It was a species of plant that was endemic to North America um, and also in other parts of the world. That particular plant was the Ribes genus. Maybe not all species of the Ribes genus, but some of the members of the Ribes genus, which of course is the gooseberries, the currants, things of that nature. The the fungal infestation was living in the, in the berry plants, in the berry bushes, and then jumping off from there into the pines and then destroying the pines. So it could live with the, the, the ribes, the, 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 the currants could live with that infection and be okay. It wasn't going to kill them. But when it came to the pines, it devastated the pines. So for a while, and also apparently to this day, in, in certain states, they had banned the import of currant. You, you couldn't plant currants. You couldn't grow them. And they were tearing them out deliberately. One of the reasons why you come to America, if you're not from here, you go, hey, what's going on? Why are all the why are all the, the purple candies grape flavored? This is not the case in other parts of the world. If you're living in another part of the world, you get a purple candy, probably it's black currant flavored. But here in America, it's great. And that's the reason why is because of that that ban that took place in the early 1900s. Well, the ban's been lifted for the most part. And there are uh, fungus resistant versions and varieties of, of, of current that could be purchased now. Uh, we just recently got some. This is part of the reason why I'm talking about it. It's, they're on order. They won't be here for a couple of weeks, weeks yet. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to get, in, get them in before spring really gets here. Um, but we ordered them up and we got them in. I noticed that there's, there's a couple of places where you cannot have them shipped. North Carolina, Vermont, places like that where they still have large amounts of pines. Um, and, and still do a little bit of uh, controlled logging or um, deliberate tree farming with pine. They don't want these, this particular species around. 
because they're still afraid that that particular fungus is going to rise up and devastate the crop. So they, they're trying to to avoid having something come in to, to disrupt the balance. Well, <clears throat> not the balance, but the imbalance <laughs> that they've got. Further out west, uh, the logging industry planted a lot of pine, too, in Oregon. Uh, later on, they changed uh, so, so, some, uh, I don't want to say zoning, but changed some things around and established the Malheur National Forest Reserve. Already had pine in it, massive monoculture of pine that had been planted. And there you can find a an Amalaria, one single organism. It's called a honey fungus is the, uh, the common name for it. I can't remember the specific, specific species name. It's genus Amalaria and the... the uh, common name is honey fungus. Anyway, it's busily chomping through that pine monoculture out there in the Malheur National Forest. And I think currently it's about four miles across. And it's just going and going and going, just wiping out everything in its path. And this is actually nature trying to correct an imbalance. Too many pine trees. Here comes the infection. This happens all the time. Um, you see it in the garden all the time. You've got a, a large number, too many of one particular type of plant, all together. And here come the pests. And this is all. This is just nature trying to create an imbalance. There's too many of one type of one thing. Nature wants a diversity of different species. Hmm. Nature has <laughs> nature has a wonderful sense of humor or none at all. I don't know. One of the, <laughs> one of those answers is true. Um, but this is what we see over and over and over again. Whenever there's some kind of imbalance, nature is going to, going to come in and, and correct it, either with an insect, with a disease, uh, with a fungus, something of that nature. And whenever the, whenever the the playing field has been leveled, and the excessive amount of whatever it happens to be that's 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 there has been eliminated, then things begin to come back in. We have pioneer species come in and colonize and build back up. So one of the things I'd be really interested to see, and uh, might be worth taking a trip out to the to the forest if we can find a way to make it happen, is to investigate that area and see what's surviving in the area where the where the amalaria has taken over and and, and devastated everything. Because I can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be something that's moved in there, something is growing, and something that the it's and something that the amalaria is not not attacking. Uh, what was it? Two years ago? Is it two years or last year? Might have been last year. I get my years mixed up. Uh here at here at the here at the homestead. At the homestead. <laughs> here at the one third acre. Uh we did some some mushroom beds with wood chips. And I put in both oyster mushroom spawn and I put in uh King Strafaria, the wine cap mushroom spawn, together in the same in the same bed. The theory that I had was whatever the whatever the 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 uh, the wine cap didn't eat the uh, the oyster mushroom would eat, but as it turns out, they wound up competing with each other. The mycelium were competing with each other for space, and as a result, they consumed all the available resources between the two of them. And only the king strafaria managed to do a couple small flushes, and that was it. After that, all the wood chips were converted into soil. Very nice soil. Good job, which is part of the reason why I wanted to do it. But I didn't get a whole lot of mushrooms out of it. Well, this just goes to demonstrate one thing. Different mushrooms competing with each other can stop the spread of mycelium. In other words, a different type of mycelium will, will prevent the spread of another one. In a natural balanced ecosystem, the amalaria would be stopped by other fungi. The other fungi required a host species to live on other than just pine. And that's the reason why there wasn't that that check to the spread of the amalaria, that the other species weren't present. It was an imbalance. Yay. Uh, Vicky's saying, I remember Dutch elm disease devastating Minnesota. Isn't that something? Oh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, we've got uh, chestnut blight. We've got uh, uh, the Dutch elm disease, red borer beetles. Um, Chesspress saying, uh, my friend is experimenting with making a slurry from my mycelium to inoculate plant roots, see if they do better. Hey, cool. Awesomeness. Uh, or, yeah, or, uh, citrus greening in Florida. Um, 
all different kinds of of, of nifty little things. And what what did we wind up with? With with the citrus screening in particular, what was going on down in Florida? Mono agriculture. In this case, they were growing a whole bunch of trees, citrus trees, uh, oranges mainly. But you have similar problems with 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 almond groves out there in California. Too much of the one thing, not enough of everything else, and as a result, uh, nature kind of revolts a little bit. They didn't have enough uh, natural pollinators out there in the in the in the far west to pollinate the almond trees, so they would have people bring in their beehives. They'd set up the beehives in the middle of the orchards. But since they, uh, almond trees don't have enough nectar in them to feed the beehives, the beekeepers would have to supplement with sugars. The bees don't like eating sugar. They want nectar. I mean, some, sure, yeah, it, it, just to get them by, but nothing but a steady diet of nothing but, but sugar. The bees don't like it. They take up, take off, and they, they fly away. And this is, this is colony collapse disorder. You see it all the time. Well, it happens for a reason. Nature's not happy. It's an imbalance. And nature's trying desperately to correct that imbalance. Over and over and over and over again. Whenever you have whenever you have monocultures, you wind up with an imbalance and then something happens. And just like the little experiment with oy, trying to hold on to something like this and move the counterbalance further and further away hmm, from the balancing point, you have to exert, exert more and more effort, and eventually it just slides off. You can't hold it anymore. Um, same thing ha happens whenever whenever we try to grow crops in mono agriculture. Tear up the ground, get rid of the weeds. Great, we got rid of the weeds. Now we can plant all corn. Awesome, we've got corn growing, but we don't have anything supplying nitrogen into the soil, so we have to what? Get nitrogen from somewhere else, bring it in, and apply it. This is great as long as you have easy to come by and easy to apply sources of nitrogen, right? Oh, but wait. Remember, the corn as a monoculture is an imbalance, and nature is trying to correct the imbalance. So here comes nature with diseases and insect predation to get rid of the monoculture of corn. So in order to take care of the diseases, which can include some in some cases fungal diseases as well, we have to apply uh, uh, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides all to that corn, along with the fertilizer, of course, to to keep it from getting destroyed by nature trying to correct the imbalance. Um, all this requires heavy machinery. If you're going to be do, doing doing the doing it the way we do with with modern agriculture, heavy machinery, uh, which means we need supply chains for fuel. We need supply chains for the for the fertilizer. We need supply chains for the fungicide, the herbicide, the pesticide. All of that is going onto the soil to try to maintain this imbalance system that is how many ever acres of corn it is that we just planted all in one row. That doesn't mean that planting corn is bad. Planting corn is perfectly fine. Planting a whole bunch of corn way out of balance with what could be ordinarily sustained in a natural setting, mm, that can create problems. And really, corn itself, because it requires close partners to, to cross-pollinate, to maintain your, your genetic diversity in the corn itself is really um, an oddball plant. It's one of the ones that it, it seems strange that nature would produce on her own. I don't think it did, but that's, 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 that's crazy talk. Mm. Sasquatch Red is saying, is David the Goods Books a good read for growers from outside of Florida? Um, I would say yes. It, 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 okay, so crazy easy Florida gardening and the uh, the stuff that that, that he, he wrote specifically for growing in Florida is probably a better use for somebody that's growing in that particular zone or climate. But everything else is still applicable. Um, so, for example, we have here free plants for everyone. The the guide to plant propagation. This this is a good book for well for everyone. It's it's numerous different examples of methods for propagation, including uh, grafting, cloning, um, tip layering, air layering, growing from seed, and why you'd want to. All kinds of good stuff. So yeah, um, I, I I'd say that's a great book to have uh, if you're interested in learning how to propagate things. At, at the very least, he he dumbs it down to the point where 
if you've got little or no experience at all, you can feel confident in at least giving it a try. And I'd say if you're going to get to the point where you're going to give, uh, say, starting things for cuttings a try, start with sweet potatoes. They're easy. Really, really easy. Uh, Sepp Holzer is brilliant. Yeah. John saying corn normally growing in, in clumps or clusters. And incidentally, that's something that David, David was also doing was instead of going with just a block of corn, he was planting several, several corn plants in a clump and then coming over and planting another clump and then coming over and planting another clump in different locations. And I think that probably would be a good way to do it as well. If you're going to be, you know, growing some corn. Okay. So what did we figure out? Whenever we try to do something other than the natural balance, the thing that nature does on its own without our help or input, we wind up creating problems. And those problems have to be corrected with lots of extra effort, lots of extra labor, lots of extra inputs. It's inefficient, grossly inefficient. And uh, let me see here. Gus Rasmus said, corners change back in time. Again. Maybe. I don't know. I do know that the kind of corn that we're growing out here is uh, about as close as you can get to to the original corn. Well, that was corn. Uh, there's there's broom corn and there's uh, the what is it the the teasonite, which is genetically related but not the same, I guess. The the big horse spotted is about the most genetically diverse corn I've ever seen. How to garden say it? Say and I start a lot of fruit trees from cuttings. Very easy. Once you get the hang of it, and you figure out what you're looking for. It gets it gets easy. Whenever you're first starting and you're looking at, it, it's like, okay, what do I do? Okay, I cut it. Uh, where do I cut it? And then what do I do with it after that? Um, hmm. All right. I'm starting to get a little bit a little bit warm. I'm gonna take my take my little jacket off. So today I'm wearing my Ridge Life shirt. Yay. I can't remember if this is mine or Mary's. It feels a little bit tight. <laughs> okay. See, before we get too much further, I'm going to do a little bit of, uh, of mail opening, if you guys don't mind. I got a package here. Let's see. I don't see Mark in the chat, so I'll give him a minute to see if he's going to show up. I got one here that I got from, from Baker Creek. That's weird. It's yellow. The package is yellow, but it's, it's green screen make, it's making it disappear. Let me check the sensitivity on my green screen real quick. Hang on. We're at 51. Let's try 50, see if that'll... Okay, that's better. It's not just disappearing. All right, here we go. No, nope, it's still it's still still being weird. All right, so this is uh, from Baker Creek Seeds. Ordered it a couple of days ago, or you know, a week or two. I noticed that they were having a sale, and they were advertising that uh, that the the profits from the sale for a certain amount of time were going to go to relief aid for. People in Afghanistan. And I thought, well, that would be that would be a wonderful excuse for me to order something that they do grow in Afghanistan. So I got I got these. This is a a florist pepper box poppy. I'm going to turn off the green screen real quick because you can't see the you can't see the thing. Let me turn it to blue. There we go. All right, all right. So we got. There we go. Florist pepper box poppies. So this is a bread seed poppy. Uh, that was weird. My screen doesn't know whether, whether it's supposed to be blue or green. There you go. <laughs> All right. So these are a bread seed poppy. And uh, if you're wondering, yes, there's, 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 Papavar somniferum. They're the same poppy that you can you can uh, um, the same poppy you can grow to 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 get the, the the opiates out of if you're interested in that sort of thing. It's legal to grow them. 
it's just not legal to collect opium from them. <laughs> so you can grow these and, uh, and, and you'll be perfectly fine. Uh, interestingly enough, they produce a lot of pollen. So the bees like them for an extra source of pollen. That's one of the reasons why you might want to have some around. Good for the bees. But there's another reason, which uh, I'm, I've been investigating, and I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot more work with, 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 with Papavar somniferum in the future in this particular area, because it turns out that if you're growing seeds to sprout for microgreens, poppy seeds are one of the most calorie dense that you can get. And just like any other seed that you can grow for microgreens, you grow, you grow the plant in your garden. For example, I grow a lot of amaranth. You grow the plant in the garden. Once you've got the plant grown, you collect the seeds. Now, the amaranth is going to give me about a pound of seeds per plant, which is a lot. I probably won't get that much from the poppies, but there will be a lot of seeds for each each plant, just not pounds for each plant. Then they're you know they're not that big. But the amaranth seeds are going to give you, I think it was for about an ounce, you'll get around 350 to 400 calories, which is decent. That's, you know, double cheeseburger territory for, for an ounce of sprouts. An ounce of these is around six to 700 calories. So two cheeseburgers or two double cheeseburgers, maybe one and a half. So if you're looking for calorie dense, uh, calorie dense seeds for sprouting to grow microgreens or sprouts from, hey, guess what? Poppies. And you know, if all else fails and you need a, a source of painkiller, they are Papavar somniferum, just not legal to collect the opium from them at the, more, at the moment. Who knows? Maybe one day that will change. But for the moment, you can still grow them. All right. So I got those. And I also got um, a couple of days before that, we got this fellow, which is a, uh, a red or swamp milkweed. I know... We went out to, to, to Turkey Mountain, the, the wilderness area, and we collected some seeds for milkweed. And we've got some that's a purple color. Um, this is going to be a red, so not exactly the same variety. But I also know that there was some of the regular old orange that I don't particularly care for and I don't want. I mean, they're okay. I mean, they're still milkweed. Good for the bees. Good for the Lepidoptera. Um, can I... I'm visible from my mouth to pass my left shoulder. Huh? Can I move the camera? I'm visible or invisible? Let's move this thing. Except here, do How about that? Okay, anyway. So I collected the, the, the seeds for the, for those poppies and, or not poppies, but the milkweed. And uh, I don't know entirely whether or not I got just the purple ones or if I got the purple and the orange. So I'm going to be starting them all and we'll see what we wind up with. Uh, this way, at least I know I have some of the, some of the, the red ones too. Well, at least I sound better. Than I look. Is it bad? Is it really bad? Okay. So we've got that coming up. We've got the amaranth, of course. I've got safflower and sunflower that we'll be growing as well. So we've got uh, amaranth, safflower, sunflower, and poppy seed. So I have at least four different amaranth, safflower, sunflower, poppy seed. Was there another one that, 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 that had started for microgreens? Okay, I got at least four different, different plants that, are, that we're growing for microgreens. Collect the seeds. Save the seeds. You could throw them in, in into a jar, into a into a into into a clay pot if you want to, and put a little cork on the top of it or what have you. Very easy to store dried seeds over the winter, and then you sprout them a couple of days, three or four days ahead of time uh, when you're planning on eating them. This gives you a source of fresh greens in the middle of the winter, uh, so it's a good storage food. You can see the you can see the bread. Ah, okay. Uh, apparently, there's some, some comments going on that I missed, so let me jump up here. I don't know if Mark's going to show up for the live stream. He might pop in and just lurk or something. All right. But I've got a package from Mark, so I'm going to open that up here in a minute. Um, okay. 
Sean was saying, you should not take the fresh pods or fresh leaves and macerate them and tincture with alcohol. You should not do that to make a medicine. It would be wrong to make your own pain medication. Okay, yeah, that's sarcasm. <laughs> he says, I'm not being sarcastic. I just believe in big pharma. All right. <laughs> All right. And create synerg synergistic transformations. So I have three types of of Asclepius here, all wild. That's awesome. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. Feed the butterflies, feed the bees, which is, you know, part of it. You know, we have uh, milkweed for the bees. And also the poppy, the pollen, is also for the bees. This is just, I can I can get something edible out of the poppy seeds later on. Uh, there might still be some trace amounts of of the, uh, the opioid alkaloid on the seeds Whenever you, whatever, oh, is, my facial hair is is being registered as green by the by the screen for some reason. That's weird. Uh, all right. <laughs> Later, John. All right. Um, Sam, have you seen the manual manual seed oil press? There, I have one. Uh, well, it's it's a pinna pinna tuba or pin tuba, something like that. Um, I still have to put it together and test it out. I'll do that here one of these days. Uh, I think probably probably next fall, whenever I harvest our peanuts and our sunflowers and our sapphires, because we can also we can also press all of those for oil. Okay, where was I? Ah, yes. All right, so. Feed the bees, yes, and also feed ourselves with the poppy seeds. All right, um, mail from Mark is over here. Here we go. And I'll just keep it turned this way so you can't see his address. I think his address is actually on his page, so I'm going to open this up and see what's in here by gum. There is another envelope. And okay, that's it. All right. Manual oil press is a family cottage business. Amen. I mean, there, there, there are people that are you know in some little third world countries, much like the United States, but not here, <laughs> that that can feed their kids by by pressing oil with the oil press with the manual oil press. And you're going to have to have some means of, uh, of of having some oil to cook with, or oil to put in your oil lamp, or things like that. If, if things go really, really weird, I don't know why it was wrapped up in this paper. Is there anything else in here? No. Okay. It's mulch. It's free mulch. By golly! Got a garden. Get those kids to bed. Darn it! All right. What do we have here? We have. Um, I don't know. There's a, a cornucopia of different things here. It says sacred wine dot tobacco. Uh oh. I don't think that's what's in here. Oh boy. Mark just threw me a whole bunch of random seeds. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Okay. Um I don't think there's anything in this. Then we have... What is this one here? I don't know what's in here. Boy. All right, so he sent me a bunch of seeds. This one's some kind of lavender, I'm going to guess. This one is... I don't know... I'm going to have to unwrap each and every one of these to find out what's in it. <gasps> you have to. You have to pass the bill to find out what's in it. <laughs> yes. The, the, okay. So the, the oil press may be made in Holland, but talking about where it's being used. Um, the one the one that I've got, that they, they're, they're using it as a, as a cottage industry in, in developing nations to generate income. 
which I thought was pretty cool. Okay. I don't know what's in this. Mark, what the heck did you send to me? <laughs> Good Lord. Oh. Okay, more seeds. Because we always need more seeds. Okay, these ones are actually labeled. Yay. All right, anything else in there? No, okay. Onion red creole. Yay. We've got uh, eggplant. Long ping tong. Mustard. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna grow those. That's a southern, uh, southern giant curled mustard. Italian globe purple artichokes. I'll go. I'll grow those too. Uh, we've got medium slim hot pepper. Can't grow them because I have to keep my my pepper strains separated, and I just don't have enough space to isolate them. Unless I'm gonna bag them. I've already got onions. We got some blue scotch curled kale. Maybe I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about seeing if I can get a hold of some uh, some brassica olicifera, some perennial, some perennial brassica, it's tree colored. Maybe that and some Turkish rocket, so I can have, have per, a, per, basically a perennial mustard. But uh, in the meantime, I'll see if I can grow the the, the annual variety. So these I'm going to put up here with the other season. We'll be starting those here pretty darn soon. I need to go through the uh, the 1020 trays and the, the 72 self dividers that I've got and see if I need to replace any. I know I've broken a couple of the uh, the 1020 trays. Vicky saying, and you have suggestions for mustard varieties to make the condiment? Hmm, good question. I don't know what exactly which variety they're they're using to make prepared mustard. In all actuality, I just know it's mustard seed. And I do know that if I take generic mustard seed and I grind it up and mix it up with with, with oil and etc., then I basically have the condiment. Uh, I've been using, uh, see, mustard, Szechuan, and uh, cayenne pepper together for for seasoning. Um, I know it's going to drive Mary nuts. We have a, we have just an entirely well stopped spice rack, but lately the only thing I'm using for seasoning are the things that we can grow here. So I've been experimenting with the mortar and pestle. I've been just taking a pinch of this and pinch of that and grinding it all up and putting it together and uh, having mustard seed for a seasoning is kind of useful. Um, I discovered that Szechuan pepper and cayenne put together give you something that gives you a, a flavor akin to black pepper, which we can't grow here. It's zone, zone 10 and further south is where you can grow black pepper. But the uh, the seed portion of the Szechuan pepper, if you were to remove the fruit, the outer the outer fleshy covering of the seed, and just dry the seed for a Szechuan pepper, it has that aromatic scent uh, that that tickles the nose, just like just the same way that a black pepper does. It just doesn't have the heat. So to give it heat, we have to give about fifty percent cayenne pepper, and then mellow it out with a little bit of mustard seed, and you've got you've got a, a spice that takes the place of having black pepper. So we don't wind up with, with food that tastes bland and tasteless. Yay. Oh, Mary says she loves it. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. <clears throat> well, I'll keep doing that then. And of course, we're going to be working on um, onions and garlic as well. Hopefully, we'll get enough together that I can start shipping onions and maybe some seed garlic before too awful long, maybe by next year. Um, if you've been watching Mary's recent videos, she got some some footage of us going around and taking the measurements to set up more of the gopher proof bed. Gopher, I can't talk. Gopher proof beds. Uh, so we have the two foot wide hardware cloth on the bottom and then using a um, uh, cement blocks. We create the, the the raised bed surface just enough so that we can put soil in there and keep the gophers from getting up to our plants. Um, that's going to be either one or two weeks down the road for, for, for a video that I'll release explaining exactly what the heck is going on. Uh, short story is we're planting mulberry trees alongside those those beds that we intend for, for growing alliums in, in the hopes that the mulberry will be able to capture sulfur, accumulate in the leaves, and then we can use the leaves is the mulch on those beds to put sulfur back into the soil to feed the alliums to make sure they have lots of, of good allicin in them 
the uh, the chemical compound that gives the gives the, the onions and the garlic the distinctive flavors and also medicinal quality too. Eventually, the uh, the roots of the mulberry should get down to the point where they're reaching the water table. And if you have a place where there's lots of uh, lots of sulfides in your water, in your well water, or the water that you can get by tapping a well, mulberry might, and I'm not guaranteeing it will, but it might help alleviate some of that sulfur by accumulating it, drawing it up, mining for sulfur. Maybe, possibly. That's the idea, anyway. I haven't really noticed too much of a sulfur flavor from the from the water we can pump out of the ground here. <laughs> but the water we can pump out of the ground here is probably better for watering your garden than drinking. If you're going to drink it, you have to filter it and then boil it. And then still, I'd rather eat some fresh fruit or vegetables to get my water that way. <laughs> um, Mary saying, so that's what garlic works for vampires and mosquitoes. <laughs> Um, hmm. There, there's, there's some, some associations with some types of bloodborne diseases that garlic might be helpful in, 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 in fighting, anecdotally speaking, and that might be a reason for the association. Maybe. Um, don't know. Can't, can't really, can't really tell you one way or the other because I just don't know. All right, so whenever you look at a forest in nature, or, or really any place where nature is doing its own thing, you'll notice that everything's growing in layers. See that? See that? Wow, I can't point. Is it up here? There we go. Uh, all right, see the, 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 row, the row of trees behind there? So this would be what we would call an, a riparian environment. So it's... it's that boundary between between the water and the land. Right there, we've got some sort of a herbaceous perennial layer plus ground cover. And then we've got some shrubs coming up. Uh, understory, right, around, right around there. And then further up, where, where are we at? That's actually probably understory tree right there, but we'd have canopy up, up, up above that. So nature wants to grow everything on top of each other. Um, if there's any scrap of sunlight left, something else is going to be there to, 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 to soak up that light and it grows nice, thick, dense, uh, especially closer to the edges. You might notice if you break through that outer boundary going into a forest, like the if you're on the northern hemisphere, the, the southern facing side, eastern and western facing sides of an area where there's uh, a stand of trees or forest, you'll have a lot of layers together right there at that spot. You'll have ground cover. You'll have, you'll have herbaceous perennials. You'll have shrubs. You'll have understory. You might even have canopy. It'll have vines running all the way through it. You'll have every single possible inch covered. And then if after you break through that and you get into, into deeper areas where it's just canopy covering up over everything, then everything thins out and you'll have maybe one or two layers in there, sometimes three, but usually not the full, the full deal. So whenever you're intentionally designing, try to keep everything on edge. In other words, you want that, you want that, that, that edge zone right there that you're seeing where all, all those little environs come together, because that's where you're going to get the most life, the most, uh, the most food, the most, most possibilities. But unless you've designed this specifically to produce food for you, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty, and it's making oxygen, but it's not going to make food. That's why we want to design forest ecosystems that make food for us. So they do double duty. They're better at converting that CO2 into oxygen, which we desperately need. And they will also produce the food that we need. Mm. Vicky saying, I get my fresh water from springs now. Rainwater is best for plants. Oh, just rub it in. Why don't you, Vicky? <laughs> INFJ forever says evening, guys. Good evening. <laughs> All right. So in this, this I have to work on my on my pointing at things. In this system that you can see on, on, on the screen behind me, nature is busily occupying every square inch. And once it's established this way, there's nobody there to water. The rainfall or, or groundwater is sufficient. 
There's nobody there to fertilize. There's nobody there to control the, the, the pests. Nature is responsible for all these regulations by itself. It doesn't need outside interference. Very little input, very little effort required. Remember that. The, the balance analogy. But whenever things are in balance, very little effort is required to maintain it. And you can make minor adjustments one way or the other as needed. Right? But even something relatively light, like this toilet tissue, whenever it's applied and is we're, we're close to the center of balance, not a whole lot of effort. But the further we get, the harder it is to hold it together and then everything collapses. And of course that's that's the problem we have. The further you move away from 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 the balance of nature, the harder it is to to maintain the unbalanced ecosystem. And anytime you're, you're trying to plant one crop of anything, it's an unbalanced ecosystem. You don't have uh, you don't have the the insect life that you ordinarily would have. You killed those off with pesticides. You don't have the fungal life that ordinarily you'd have. You killed those off with, with fungicides. And you did that because some of those, although some of them were beneficial and helpful, the other ones were going to destroy your monoculture because it was an imbalance. You don't have the uh, the nitrogen that you would ordinarily ordinarily have from a from a, a properly functioning ecosystem. So you have to import that. So all these extra inputs, all the extra effort that you have to put in just to maintain that 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 system that wasn't in balance, you could expend much less effort by intentionally designing a multi-layered simulating nature forest system, and then just design it to produce the food that you want. So let's see here in 7a, I've got pecans for a canopy. I've got uh, some assorted fruit trees for understory. Uh, like peach right now i've got peach and i've got um i've got pear those are both understory trees uh i'm getting some jujubes in pretty soon which is going to be kind of interesting understory trees uh shrub layer we have some high high bushes for example uh vaccine uh, blueberries we've got those coming in or we have those growing right now actually um hazelnuts would be also shrub layer type stuff Cherry trees, when they they arrive, these are the ones I'm getting are, are small cherry trees. So uh, about 10 to 12 foot for height and spread altogether. Shrub layer stuff. Underneath that, we have our basis perennial layer. For that, we've got things like the uh, the walking onions. I can plant garlic as well. Um, some of the, some of the, the smaller uh, woody shrubs, goji berry, um, currants. What else do we have going on out there? A few other things. In any case, these are all perennials. Once established, they take care of themselves. I don't really have to do a lot with them other than just make sure that they are maintained and uh, all, all the, the, the the habitat necessary is maintained for, for, for everything I need. The shrub layer gives, gives, us, gives us a spot for things like praying mantises to, to hunt from and to, to lay their eggs in. The, uh, the retaining walls, rock walls, give, give a place for for, for snakes and lizards to to go and sun themselves and take seek shelter from their predators. Their predators, of course, are going to be out in force because they're looking for those and they're looking for the toads and they're probably going to be looking for, for rats and voles as well because those, those critters are going to be there. The problem I'm having currently with gophers is also a problem of imbalance. Ultimately, there's a predator that I need that isn't in the ecosystem. And I'm thinking the reason that predator isn't around is because I don't have sufficient surface water to attract them. Uh, the larger predators need more water than, than the small things. The small things may be able to get by with the dew on a leaf, but if you're going to want a macro predator, you're going to have to give it some, some source of water, some source of shelter, the things that it needs to survive. Just having the prey species available isn't enough. Hmm. Vicky's saying the soil is stripped of nutrients repeated and they are not replaced when crops are grown and shipped. This is true. Uh, whenever you're growing annuals, you're taking more out of the soil than you're putting back into it. Perennials put back into the soil, annuals take it out. So it's okay to grow some annuals. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But if you are going to be growing annuals, you have to find some way to get your, your, your inputs back into the soil. So the more perennials you can grow, the better off you are for just maintaining soil health. The less you have to tear the soil up, 
the less damage to the microbiome, the healthier soil is, the more life you have, the more life you have, the more diversity of life you have, the, the more productive the system is. And if you produce a productive system that also feeds you, then you're, you're, you're on your way to happiness because you don't have to struggle quite so hard to get your, your, your daily bread. It's right there, ready and available for you. Uh, harmony and balance. I remember seeing this in the dictionary once. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much the talk. That's it. Mary's saying football would run off the cats. Uh, yeah. Cats are cats are a top a top predator. They're an apex predator. You can have one or two of them around, but uh, you don't want to have a whole bunch of cats around because a whole bunch of cats is exactly the same thing as having a whole bunch of corn or wheat or barley or squash. It's too much of one thing. An imbalance to nature. Something's going to have to happen to correct that balance. Same thing goes for for animals as it does for uh, as it does for plant species. You have too many deer, then nature's going to step in and do something about this imbalance. Take what happened here in here in well in America. It was already happened in Europe a long time ago. Settlers came, they settled the area, said, "Hey, this is a great spot. We want to live here." But there's an awful lot of wolves. There's an awful lot of mountain lions. There's an awful lot of bears, and and we we're going to have a hard time growing our chickens and our 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 our. our our cattle and our pigs and our stuff like that with these predators around. Let's get rid of the mountain lions and the wolves and the foxes and every other predator you can think of. Boy, whether you shoot them, trap them, get rid of them, drive them off, try to get rid of these predators because we don't want them uh, attacking our, our, our animals. Okay, that's fine. But once that happens, mankind is now stuck in the position of not having a predator that was necessary to maintain the natural balance. Starting to move that, starting to move that little slider further and further away from balance, further and further away. So we have to take over and start hunting the things that the deer, or the, the things, the things that the that the mountain lion or the or the or the wolves would be hunting. So we're we're, we're going to have to take out the deer. We're going to have to control the deer population. There's a big difference though between a, a human being hunting a deer with rules and regulations and hunting permits and hunting seasons, and a predator taking a prey animal whenever it's hungry. See, the predator is only going to take the prey animal to feed its hunger. That's all. It's the only reason it's going to do it. And it's going to pick the slow ones, the weak ones, the ones that are easier to take out. In other words, the ones that you need to have removed for the health of the herd, in the case of deer. Humans come in with a deer tag. Maybe they can get two or three, maybe four, even five deer per season. What are they going to look for? Uh, let's see, a trophy. Good meat, good meat, good meat, good meat. Um, okay, they stock their freezer, but now how about culling the, the, the sick members of the herd? What hunter goes out there and says, I'm going to deliberately go and hunt and shoot deer that I know I'm probably not going to eat because they're too sickly. Anybody? No, you only got a couple of tags. You're not going to waste them, right? So as a result, <laughs> even though we do have people taking up the, over the place of the, the, the natural predator, they're not doing the same thing the natural predator would be doing because the, the motivations are different. Is there a good solution to that? Well, I, mean, I suppose we could... Uh, maybe have some people designated to go out and, and hunt specifically for maintaining the health of, of, of wild animal populations and for, for people doing that, the, the ordinary rules and restrictions about when you hunt and so on and so forth might not apply. I mean, personally, I don't really want to go out hunting during deer season. Bunch of idiots with guns <laughs> just shooting at anything that moves doesn't sound like my kind of party. <laughs> I don't want to be there. Um, Mary's saying, yeah, there's early people thinking they can turn this into England. That's kind of interesting because we did import. Um, I, I have to say we because I do have some English ancestors um, and settler ancestors, original settler ancestors. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, we did import, I believe it was the, uh, the swallows. Was it swallows? Yeah, I think so. We we imported the uh, the I think it was barn swallow from England because we got over here or the, the Europeans got over here and said we're used to seeing these little swallows that we had had back in back in the home country and um, we don't see them so they brought them over 
they weren't going to fly over by themselves. Somebody had to bring them over. And now we have a lot of these 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 small birds that don't really do anything for us ecologically speaking. Um, they're really more of a pest than anything, but they're 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 everywhere, and that's you know, importing a species. You guys hear that? Hey. Yeah, I hear you. Knock it off. That one's not Sergeant Crybaby. That's a that's a wandering kitty cat, wanting to 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 hide out under the house. I don't mind if you go under there and just keep it down. There's going to be a cat fight. I can tell. All right. Well, Mary said something. Hang on a second. Oh, okay. Let's let me back up. Oh, da, 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 da. oh yeah. All right. All right. So Mary's talking about wasting disease. Yeah. All right. This this is the problem. The the natural predator is not there. Humans don't do the same thing that the natural predator does. So nature has to step in to correct this imbalance. There's too many deer. The predator's gone. There's too many deer, and now we have a disease, wasting disease, and. You don't want to kill the deer for 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 your for your for for a trophy or for the the fridge if it's obviously sick. So the 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 rules for 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 hunting make it to the point where you're not going to be shooting the sick deer. The problem continues. Um, yeah, kill them all, stupid people. Well, we don't. You know, people didn't know what they didn't know. A lot of the things that we know now about ecology are things that we figured out over the past. 50, 60, 70 years even, last 100 years maybe. So, you know, they didn't know whenever they were, they were planting trees to replace the clear cuts that they they should plant a diversity of species. They were looking at some of them, well, this is, a, this is a weak wooded tree. I don't know what it's good for. I don't know, know why I should plant an alder, right? So whenever they came through, they might have gotten rid of alder trees, but they didn't replant them. Alder tree is a nitrogen fixer, and it's uh, able to form... Uh, mycorrhizal associations with several different families of mycorrhizal fungi so it can connect the woody hardwood species with some of the fruit bearing trees or some of the annual vegetables as well so having an alder tree in the midst of a diverse landscape uh, is, is kind of like a linchpin it holds everything together and binds everything together so they reinforce each other but they wouldn't have known that. This is something that that's only really very recently been discovered. A lot of this research only came about since the 1980s and, and since. Um, Vicky's saying, I wonder if a shrew or two would deal with your gophers. Uh, or maybe ferret? If I could get a if I could get a wild ferret. Ferrets don't eat chickens. See, here's the problem. I know I want chickens in the future, but I don't want to introduce a predator that's going to kill off my chickens. <laughs> So if I'm going to attract a predator, I want to attract a predator that uh, I can work with. That's, that's, that's not going to, to devastate the other things that I want. No, I have to try to avoid having an imbalance with too many chickens as well, I guess. Uh, Mary's saying, I used to drive across the state of Oklahoma and only see jackrabbits out west. Oh, yeah, we were talking about this the other day. Now she sees white-tailed deer out west. Out west, it's not a lot of forest. White-tailed deer are more of a, more of a, a forest deer. Out west, you'd expect to see some pronghorn or antelope, something something like that. But now there's lots of white-tailed deer out there because they're just expanding and spreading and their, their, their numbers are growing. The predators don't get rid of the deer. And the predators, it's not just deer, it's other pests too. I would consider deer to be an agricultural pest. Um, a few of them is fine. Part of maintaining a, a healthy ecosystem, but a whole lot of them, they're, they're a disaster. Uh, reintroduction scheme of wild boars and wolves running up in northern Scotland. Hey, there you go. Try <laughs> only now do we realize, hey, we actually really needed these 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 critters, <laughs> and maybe that means that we have to take extra precautions to protect our our, our chickens and our, our 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 pigs or our cattle, or maybe maybe we shouldn't re be relying upon those those types of livestock quite so much as we are for sustenance. Uh, does that mean that we eat less red meat? Yeah, probably. Uh, would that make us healthier overall? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so maybe the cure is good for us too, or, or good for us too. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there. Um, Vicky saying, if I hunted venison, I would prefer young, dumb, and tender. 
There you go. Oh, that explains what Mary said later on. Okay, got it. Uh, create synergistic uh, transformation is the same for trees. They harvest the straightest and tallest. Yeah, you, you want you want that lumber. You want the good lumber for 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 making uh for making buildings out of, the good lumber for making furniture out of. Uh, you don't really want that 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 weak and twisted wood so much. You leave that stuff. Um, well, if that's what's propagating, that's what you're going to get more of. Mary says, so many people have their animals so hopeless, they're useless They're useless otherwise. Uh, the selective breeding of, of animals, livestock in particular, creating strains that just can't survive on their own. Uh, that's also kind of a problem. If you're not around to take care of them, then you've got an animal suffering. That's just not right or fair to the animal. Not that I'm, you know, I'm bleeding hard or anything, but still, cruelty is cruelty. John's saying, offer an incentive to take, take the weaker or the weaker members of the herd. Yeah, I, if, if we're going to keep on having people imposing rules about what we can hunt, when we can hunt, where we can hunt, then maybe making it more attractive to take the, the weaker members of the herd might be a way to fix that problem with imbalance. We're not going to repeat what Mary just said, but <clears throat> you can read chat. Uh, The only thing you give us swallows. You're trying to say swallow, swallows. It says they can tell you when it's going to rain. Fly, they fly low at high pressure. Starlings are an invasive pet. Oh, man. Yeah. Just hordes of starlings coming out. About the only time I'm going to ever break out the BB gun and start shooting at birds is whenever the starlings are swarming. Theoretically speaking, not that I actually do that or or do that anymore, just in case starlings have become you know a migratory bird and are now protected or something. I don't know. Apparently, crows are protected. Who knew? All right, zombie deer make great great great, great roadkill. Uh, they're infected with the wasting disease. They wind up wandering out into the roads. They they destroy your they destroy your smart car because it's. Yeah. Let me see. Zombie deer movie, Attack of the Zombie Deer. Zombie deer kills card. Uh, yep, yep, yep. All right. Create synergistic transformation. Says, I have hawks. They eat the voles and gophers. Only lo lost one chicken to them. I lost a bunch of chickens. But I don't think it was just a, I don't think it was just a hawks. I think there's some other critters that were getting, getting to them as well. I just need to redo the entire chicken enclosure before we introduce more chickens. Uh, but yeah, hawks will eat hawks, hawks will eat voles and gophers. At least, you know they'll, they'll they'll try to catch them whenever they come out. The 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 uh, the gophers when they poke their heads out, a hawk can get them. And I've seen the hawks trying to get them. I don't know if they were successful or not. Because um, you know, if I got too close to be able to actually really get a good look at what was going on, I'd scare off the prey, and the hawk wouldn't be able to hunt. So I, I've watched them dive bombing the ground whenever it doesn't look like there's anything there, and you go check it out later, and you see that there's. There's those air holes where the gophers were coming up, so I know that they're hunting them. Um, but they can only they can only get them when they can see them. And we've got some good hawk population out here. I mean, and some some really really impressive large hawks, broad wing hawks, uh, as well as the the red tails. Uh, that and the uh, the national buzzard has been known to fly overhead a few times. They they like to go up to the dam and eat the fish uh the national buzzard does and uh, they they nest down by the river and they might have some nests up to the north of us here too but just a few days ago there was one circling maybe about 50 to 50 to 75 yards maybe 100 tops i i, I could make out his beak and, and and see the orange um circling overhead the uh, the national buzzard um, you see his 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 huge 12 foot wingspan and this fan of white feathers on his tail, the white feathers on his head. <laughs> Bald eagle, national buzzard. Uh, Vicky's saying uh, that's why I suggested any small predator, any member of the weasel family is deadly to poultry. I don't think ferrets eat chickens, but I could be wrong. INFJ is saying, "Yep, we only have four canine teeth. We only need that. Uh, we we only need that that portion of meat. Well, I mean, small amount of meat. I 
We could eat it. We got the teeth for it. Except we're down here. I kind of lost that one. Um, let me see. There's Joe. Hi, Joe. <sighs> Late as always. Mm -hmm. Damn Mexicans, tell you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Mary is saying, I think of chicken race and farms like Buddhists think about fish. Yeah, that's 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 kind of interesting. Um, well, depending upon what sect you are. I mean, there 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 are some very, very, very strict we will not eat any animal at all type Buddhists, and then the, then there's the the more common average, which is fish are fine. <laughs> the life of a fish is I eat things that are smaller than me and I will be eaten by something bigger than me. And that's the expectation. And if you're and if you're in the, in that category of Buddhist, then eating the fish is is doing it a favor. You're giving it the opportunity to have another life quickly. <laughs> Just, let's let's go ahead and get you on to the next life. And thank you very much for, for feeding me. Hopefully that's that's positive karma for you and you can re be, 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 be reborn better. Um but yeah, I mean, there's I'm not a vegan. <laughs> Uh, John saying, "Why can't we shoot the Can Canadian geese? Because they're protected by uh, migratory uh, bird treaties. It's, it's actually treaty law in between between us and Canada. I think Mexico too. So we cannot interfere with them. We have to we have to let them fly and not touch them. But I can guarantee you that if things fall apart, people are going to be eating some Canadian geese." Uh, let's see. On about a third of an acre, you can graze probably three geese, two or three, if it's mostly grass. Preferably have something better than just grass to feed them. Give them some forbs, you know, some some broadleaf, uh, non-grassy plants. Preferably something that can grow quick. Uh, but they'll eat just about everything. I've seen them gobble down sunflowers. I've seen them gobble down uh, calabash, the birdhouse gourds. They'll eat those. They'll eat the seeds. They'll eat everything. Give them the opportunity to, and then they'll, they'll try to, to eat more if they can. Um, yeah, they poop everywhere, and the and the poo is not is not pleasant smelling. They foul water quickly, and uh, Hamed Mosavi would like to 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 be hidden from the channel if uh, Monterey would mind so much. Um, but neighbor has, I think, currently five geese on a third of an acre. And it's 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 too much. He's going to have to supplement their feed. They're not going to be able to get all the way through winter without being supplemented. So drop those numbers down. Make it about three. And then if you're if you're doing mixed with only only limited forage, uh, one or two on a third of an acre. So that would make three or four per acre with with a mixed density arrangement. You could probably get away with more more ducks than geese. Um, Duck eggs are coming in smaller packages than goose eggs. A goose egg is about the equivalent to four chicken eggs. A duck egg is about a chicken egg's worth of egg. So probably be better off with ducks or chickens than, than, than geese if you want to get the eggs. Not that there's anything wrong with raising geese. You can do it. John says, they're mean. Yeah, depends upon which geese you get, too. I mean, all geese are kind of. Um, it's, it's, it's the mentality. Uh, and they just happen to be bigger. Bird mind is is different from from mammal mind. In, in bird mind, if I if I charge at you, and you turn and run away, that means you don't belong here, and I should charge at you. So the fact that you you reacted defensively whenever they came at you, told them that they should be coming at you. You're you're, you're something that they can eat, or you're something that they need to drive away. But you're not supposed to be here. So they're gonna they're gonna come after you. If instead of running away from a goose, whenever it comes running up, up at you and attempts to bite at you, you reach out there and grab it by the neck and 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 start thinking about how yummy and tasty the goose is, and then let it go, the goose will turn around and waddle its way off <laughs> because it doesn't want to be eaten, and it by your behavior knows that you're not a prey species, uh, and you're meaner than it is. Not as easy to do that with the the big African geese. Those those can those can kind of hurt when they nip at you. And he says crows creep her out. Uh, raccoons are the worst chicken predators here. Raccoons are nasty and clever too. They can figure out how to open doors. 
<laughs> if they can figure out how to open doors and get to your get to your birds, your birds don't have a chance. Well, unless you have enough space for them to escape. So once again, too many chickens and too too small a space. Nature will try to correct that imbalance, and a raccoon is part of that. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, so I've, I've chats caught up to where I was talking about the national buzzard. <laughs> Uh, Vicky's saying Ben Franklin had a better idea with the turkey the wild ones are wearing. Yeah, well, wild, wild turkeys. Uh, the wilder you can get your livestock, the better off it is. The more more capable it is of surviving without a whole lot of effort or input on your own. This is why whenever I get chickens again, they're going to be uh, red jungle fowl, as close to the original bird as I can get. Let's see. Some people say plants are sentient too. I don't know about sentient, but they uh, they do make a certain amount of sense. If it's programmed responses, and, and, and well, okay, so sentient would indicate there's some sort of thought process going on. Do plants think? Do plants feel? There's some interesting experiments in that area. Um, it's nothing like human sentience or human intelligence, that's for sure. Uh, Mary's saying Ferris, Ferris might eat baby chickens. Okay, yeah, that's that that's a good point. They might go after this they might go after the babies. But hopefully you have, you know, uh your 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 adult chickens are are wild enough that they can defend their babies. So there's that. Guard goose, guard duck, one pet rooster. <laughs> Put all the rest ends. All right. Geese will run away from a broomstick. Oh, yeah. Um, a broomstick or or one of these, actually. So, well, domesticated geese, not the wild ones. The wild ones aren't, aren't, aren't conditioned, but the d domestic ones are conditioned to respond to a guy carrying a stick. Uh, you, can, you can actually herd geese with a stick. And... and Control them with a stick on your hand, oddly enough. Get one of these. Hang on a second. Let me duck around behind this 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 curtain here for a moment and grab grab a stick such as one might use for the herding of geese. Ta-da. Look at that. There we go. Yeah. Stockman's cane. You can use this thing to to herd geese and sheep and goats and and trees. <laughs> I use it for tree herding. Reaching up and grabbing those branches and pulling them down so I don't have to get up get out the ladder is always kind of handy. Create synergistic transformation. Send. You seen the homeless sheep guy? He's nomadic and tethers sheep to graze and he milks them. Yeah, uh, you can absolutely do that. Sheep. There are some. Some species of sheep that are, are raised specifically for the quality of their milk. I know it may sound strange because we're not used to drinking sheep's milk here in the States, but it's a thing. And really, it makes a lot of sense. If you're going to have a limited number of, of, of animals that you can graze on the, on the space that you have, trying to get as many functions out of the same animal as you possibly can makes sense to me. Uh, you grow sheep, raise sheep, uh, you get milk out of them. So you can have milk, cheese, butter, wool. To make uh, clothing out of, hides, make your shoes out of them, jackets, stuff like that. Uh, and, of course, meat. So it's a multi-purpose animal. John Pumphrey's taken off. Take it easy, John. I am over an hour here. Raccoons are worse than cats with hands, he says. <laughs> Gangsters of the animal world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll come and go, hey, like them shoes. <laughs> Joe is say, saying, what predator would eat only the head of fowl? Um, the couple, actually. <laughs> Owls as well. Um, owls will do it. There's a few others who probably do it too. Just 
get the heads close enough that they can get a hold of them and bite the head right off. Now, weasels, if they get into a, into, into a chicken coop or, or dove coat or, or other place where you're, you're raising poultry or any sort of fowl, have a tendency to get a little bit, a little bit kill crazy. They'll go nuts and kill everything in sight and only eat a little bit. Whereas, you know, other predators will, will only kill what they're going to eat. INFJ says, love raccoons. They're so smart. I mean, they are. They're also, <laughs> they're also jerks is what they are. Uh, another carry rabies is going to be nasty, but still like, I know they're cute, right? You, you really wish that you could just, you know, like go, hey, this bump, how's it going, buddy? But you can't. <laughs> Very soon. You know how many times I've had to move geese to the warehouse trying to load a sim? <laughs> you can't harass them, though, because they're migratory birds and they're protected by law. Oh, really? Mary said, wild geese will respond to a stick, too. That's kind of cool. Let's see. Brian said, hey, send them on over. I'm a modest guy. Thank you for the for the super chat, Brian. Greatly appreciate it. All righty, guys. Uh, natural balance and imbalances that we create whenever we try to to, to, to impose a a, uh, a monoculture it might seem convenient right it might seem convenient that we that, that we have all, all of these these wonderful foods growing in one spot but then nature says hey this isn't the way we do things and nature steps in and tries to correct that balance and we have to exert more and more effort to maintain the imbalance anywho that's the top, guys. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and get off of here and uh, and refill my coffee cup and, and start working on on well on on next week's program, which is going to be uh, if you if you're watching Mary's Mary's little uh, videos that she's putting up. Um, I'm doing a little bit of talking and thinking through some of the things that I want to say and how I want to, how I want to put things. Uh, we're going to be dealing with some sensitive stuff. This, this next week for, for a live stream, uh, going back to um, climate, atmosphere, and a very, very, very important thing that we should be doing. I know a lot of people are, are, are worried about, about climate climate change and, and wanting governments to step in and do something and enforce rules and, 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 and make those evil polluting companies pay and waiting for someone else to do something. And even though... I believe that uh, the, the the view that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere being produced by man is 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 actually not a bad thing, and I'll explain why whenever we get around to that. Uh, there are some people that believe that there is something that even even if they, you're of that mindset, there is something you can do about it. The power is definitely in your hands. You can always plant more trees and shrubs and vines and herbaceous perennials and understory trees and ground covers and increase biodiversity capture more sunlight through photosynthesis synthesis convert that carbon dioxide back into oxygen and uh, help us all breathe easier and that's something that everybody can do you don't have to wait around for some some external savior to come along and do it for you uh, anybody can plant a tree so oh uh, yeah stop mowing <laughs> <laughs> if the HOA will let you get away with it. Um, so thank you very much for joining us tonight. I hope you're with us next week whenever we uh, whenever we get into that rather sticky topic and hopefully we don't uh, we don't get shut down uh, or, or upset too many people by by telling the truth about some of these things. Uh, there is a great possibility that yes, mankind is causing the climate to change. At the same time, that change is not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> because the climate did change in the past to what we have now. And, uh, and there was in, in, in the course of getting from what we had in the past to the current day, we lost a lot of biodiversity. So 
creating an environment where we can get some of that back, I don't see that that's a bad thing. Uh, there are some things that we need to do along the way to make it happen. Um, but we'll get into that more next week. Anyway, I hope you found the video informative or at least entertaining. If you did, well, you know what to do. Guys, I will catch you next time.